Hello GitConf. My name is Matt Billman and I'm the CEO and co-founder at Netlify. And I'm really excited to be here giving a keynote at this specific conference since Git from its onset has really had an enormous effect on everything I've done through Netlify and on everything that we're doing today to really make the modern web a better place for web developers and for builders and for companies. And uh, that's what I want to talk to uh, you all about today. How Git changed the web. And at the onset, it might not seem entirely obvious that a version control system that we managed to work with our source code and uh, our repositories and work as developers with um, text files and uh, all these things has anything specific to do with the web and specifically the modern web. It would be easy to think that, that these two were, were different worlds and that web apps evolved completely differently from how we actually manage the source behind those web apps. But today I'm going to try to sort of go back in time and see like what was it that made Git so transformational and how has that whole transformation changed how we built and ship modern web applications and modern websites. Now, if you're old enough like me, you'll remember the world before Git very well. Before Git, there were other like early stages of decentralized source control, but what we were all typically using day to day was centralized source control systems like Subversion. Uh, at the time, like, Subversion was really like the most common source control system. It was also open source. Um, it was based around like a repository always running on a source control server, typically behind Apache's HTTP server. And you would like set up every repository as a server that the uh, different clients would then connect to and they would copy like a local working copy down to, to your own machine, to your own computer, to your own laptop. Um, and the server would really be the single source of truth. And you would have to really maintain that server. You would have to be a systems operator to some degree to have your subversion system running. You would also really typically not set up a new subversion server from some hobby project or for something small, a little scratch pad you were working on, like subversion servers were, they, they felt like sort of more of a real thing. And it, it was more of a, a, an, an always operations task to have them running on some Linux machine somewhere that you could connect to and that you could uh, update and upgrade over time and keep, uh, keep, keep track of. And then something really magical happened the first time I, I got introduced to, to Git. And I want just everybody to remember how impressive this was when, 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 when you saw it the first time, especially when you came from this world of like subversion based uh, main repositories and so on. When I first saw Git, what I saw really felt like magic rather than just a small uh, change in, in, in one source control system or another. And like, I want to jump in to, to just try to remember, like I'll, I'll, I'll do a little demo here and it's nothing impressive today. It's something that we are all doing every day and that we are all gotten really used to and that we probably all see is like, this is just how things work, right? But when I came from the world of subversion and realized that I could just take like some completely empty folder like this on my laptop and write the magic words of Git in it and suddenly have this initialized empty Git repository on my own laptop doing things and I could like start adding a file. Let's do some little readme here and uh, be impressed with Git. Um, now suddenly I had like status, I had like a, a, a history of what was going on. I can add files to my repository and I can do my first little commit here and, and, and see the, the history of that without any setup, without any provisioning, without managing any other servers, I could just do it here. 
and even more groundbreaking for me like again we're so used to this now that it's easy to forget but when i found out that i could just like do a checkout and and instantly have a new branch i could go in and 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 add something to it and immediately i could like see diffs i could see the difference between one branch and another i can do my commit here and update the readme file i can check out main again and now like again we're so used to it now but but when i first realized how this completely changed how folders worked on my local machine it blew my mind right like i could have one readme i could type this command to check out the the other branch and suddenly I have a completely different readme. And to me, that, that, that really felt like magic. Suddenly every folder on my laptop had a whole new potential. And what used to be like a really cumbersome big operation, which was like merging different branches in a subversion server, it, it became as, as easy to just like pull in another and another branch and, and merge it and typically you would just get the result you expected and, um, and and have like this whole trackable version history of every commit you ever had locally. This was such a big change. It's really hard to remember, but it was a tremendous change. And then GitHub suddenly emerged like as if this wasn't enough um, and, and allowed us to go in and create new repositories in online and just instantly sync these local decentralized folders there right and i'm just gonna go through because again if if you've lived through the era before this and remember how it was to set up a subversion server and manage it and operating then it's pretty magical to think that that in this whole case i had like no setup i had no provisioning or anything like that everything felt instant and i went from a local experience of one of my folders becoming magical to an online experience of suddenly being able to share this uh, this repository I built locally with everyone in the world. And everyone that checked it out locally would have like all of that magic and a full copy and they would be able to work in the same way locally. It was really like magic, right? Like there was no longer any servers, any folder could be a re repo. Branches were instant and awesome. Uh, and a lot of the work that used to be really tough and cumbersome, like managing different environment and, and merging between them now became really simple. Suddenly, every change we made could have its own branch and we could share these branches online. And interestingly enough, the decentralized uh, characteristics of Git was actually what made it really easy to start adopting centralized platform like GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket with a feeling that there wasn't actually this very deep login to their platform. We could always check out the whole repository our, ourselves. We were still like full owners, but we could start building conventions together around URLs and workflows. And GitHub really came with the possibility of defining Git as a cloud workflow. It really went from just versions of source code to a tool on like centered around how do we work together as developers to build and publish. We started having this idea of instant repos where every hobby project, everything we would ever want to work on could instantly become a repository and we could share it with others with no servers, with no provisioning, with no waiting, with no DevOps or no systems operations to keep our subversion repositories running. And uh, GitHub and then later GitLab and Bitbucket all introduced this concept of, of pull requests or merge requests or whatever each platform calls it. But this idea that every change set can be a URL that you can visit that can be the home for your code reviews that's cloud-based and where your whole team or the whole world in terms of open source projects can see what you're working on, can comment on every line and can 
collaborate together in an asynchronous manner that also really unleashed a lot of the patterns we're seeing today around how we work together remotely, how we build distributed cultures. All of this would not have happened without these small pieces of magic that suddenly emerged from being able to turn every folder into, in, into this magical repository where every change set could be compared and pulled and pushed and synced globally. So again, what does all this have to do with the web? And how does Git actually map onto the web? So once again, I want to go a little bit back to the days of, of subversion and think about like how version control and repositories looked like, but also how did the web look like at that time? So in the time of, of subversion, again, like we had this typical subversion server, a typical running Apache, we had maybe PHP, maybe Ruby and Rails, maybe something else that we would like pull down locally, we would had a shallow local copy and the server would always be sort of the single source of truth we had to coordinate with. In the same way at that time, the, the, the web was really based around like this request response like world where the browser was really more of a document viewer that would send a request to a server. It would get like a, a shallow copy of, of, of some document, right? It would get like a specific HTML for this URL generated on the fly. And then it's, as a user, you could look at that and request the server to do some, some other actions. And as developers in the world of subversion, we would typically operate with very long lived uh, branches that were almost like each their own repository. We would have some production branch, we would have a staging branch and also sometimes a development branch. Sometimes people would even stay away from that just because in subversion handling like the merges and keeping these different branches in sync turned out to often be really hard. Anyone that's dealt with like a complex merge process in, in subversion and going through all the conflict resolutions and so on, well, we'll, we'll still have some scars from it. Um, but the, the characteristics was that we would be running these like almost like it felt almost like a server for, for each environment, even if it was uh, run in the same subversion server. And the web really much mirrored that, right? Like we would used to have our production environment, our staging environment, and sometimes our development environment. And everybody that's that's worked with that knows the same, like it's really hard to keep those up, uh, to keep them synced. Uh, you have to do systems operations on each of those. You have to make sure that language versions and libraries are synced between all of them. Um, and you have to make sure that the data is sort of representative for each of these environments. Um, and uh, it's a completely different process to work with than what we have now. So when we started out Netlify, it was really because we saw to some degree that, that GitHub and Git created this new world where we could start thinking about collaborating in code in a different way and where the modern browser sort of really started allowing us to, to treat the web UI as more of a self-standing application that we could push to end users, run in the browser, and then go to a world where instead of having like this big monolithic application where the web UI and the database and the application layer were all tied together in one development and staging and production environment, instead we could really start like just decoupling the web UI from all the backend business logic and we could start seeing the backend split into all these different APIs and services where some are your own, but a lot of, the, a lot of them are other people's services like Twilio or Stripe or Contentful or Sanity or Algolia or any of the emerging services in the, in, in the web space. And this really became like what we today talk about as the jam stack, right? Like this idea of a stack that's moved up a level where we push the UI straight to the browser and then talk to all these different APIs and services, either as build time or, or runtime. And some of the really early pioneers in this space uh, were, I want to give some, some shout outs to these tools of Jekyll and Ember that really paved the way for, for some of the things we've seen. And obviously 
Jekyll was a static site generator created by the founder of GitHub, Tom Preston Werner, that, that really started saying, hey, for all of these content-based websites, why, why are we so centered on like this long ring, running server with its database and all the complexities of maintaining it? What if each website could just be a Git repository with a build step that knows how to take all the different source files in GitHub and output a ready to go website that we can then run statically as, as, a, as a static website uh, and eventually push to a CDN and get amazing performance benefits and security characteristics around. And um, Ember was one of the really pioneering single page application frameworks at its time that really started taking the browser seriously as more of an operating system. And in the beginning of the history of Ember, uh, people that, that, that were in that world will remember the sort of the, the standard was to use a Rails application and sort of have Ember inject itself into the view layer and everything was still sort of coupled strictly together between like the Rails backend and the Ember front end. And then the team started developing Ember CLI that really pioneered the idea of like, hey, what if we completely decouple the, the, the web UI layer from this backend layer? What if whatever API we talk to, that's just an implementation detail. And we have a whole set of tooling just for building our front end application. And today with the Jamstack approach, that's really become like the standard way we are thinking about web UIs. We're no longer thinking them as living inside templates in some monolithic application. We're thinking them as, as code that can live in their own Git repository and follow their own set of workflows. And this whole idea of being able to work locally was so important for, for, for this whole move to the Jamstack. When GitHub and Git emerged, again, I sort of hinted at how this idea of decentralization and of being able to run everything locally was also strangely what allowed GitHub to massively accelerate what you could do together in a collaborative cloud platform where platforms like SourceForge and so on based on subversion before this were miles away from, from establishing the same level of conventions of, of how we do things. Um, and part of it came just from the security of being able to, to, to work fully local and then push. The same is sort of what we've tried to do when we started Netlify, which is a cloud platform for, for web development that allows developers to build, to publish and to operate modern websites and web applications. We built that on top of this same idea that you should be able to just clone a Git repository and have a full local environment where, where, where you can work exactly with the same characteristics as your production website will have but decoupled from, from running servers and operating databases and so on. And we also started seeing that these workflows that emerged for developers in, in collaborating on code, especially this change away from long living environments, long living production staging and dev environments, but more towards pull requests and branches where each feature branch or each bug fix or each launch update has its own short-lived branch that will have a pull request that will have a URL that you can collaborate around. We saw that why not apply that same way of working to the production and the publishing and the operations of, of websites. And we introduced this concept of deploy previews back in 2016, where we really said like, you always have, of course, a, a production side with, with, with a main URL, but why not give every pull request its own deploy preview, each with a unique URL that you can share, that you can collaborate on, and that you can work on. And I'll jump in to do a little more uh, live coding from the repository I, I just got started here. And again, this is not to, to really demonstrate something completely unique or, or, or new. It's more to really trace down like how much this idea that Git introduced of our local environment of working with text files locally, of building everything locally and then syncing to, to a server, 
how much that has also influenced how we do modern web development today with these self-standing UIs. So I'm gonna go into my repo for, from before and I'm gonna type npm init astro to start a new project with um, a, a really exciting new tool called called Astro. It's one of the one of the frameworks that I'm really excited about. Um, it's a build around like modern uh, ESM modules and and Snowpack. Uh, and uh, the whole idea with Astro is that it allows us to do a lot of really smart things with modern component libraries at build time, and then define precisely what we want to actually be JavaScript and dynamic um, and, and only have those part generate any JavaScript at runtime. It's a, it's a pretty cool framework. If you haven't checked it out, I, I encourage you to check it out. It also allows us to completely freely pick which uh, component library and which underlying sort of UI framework we want to lean on. In this case, I've picked Swell, but uh, Astro can work both with React or Preact or Vue, and uh, you can even mix and match different component styles in the same in the same library. So I'll start uh, installing the dependency from my new Astro side. And meanwhile, we can open up the actual code um, for our new repository here make it a little larger so hopefully people can follow along. Um, we can see we have a new readme file, a new astro file that has pages and components. Um, we finished installing all the necessary dependencies and then I run, run a command called netlify dev. Netlify dev is like pretty smart around what framework you're you're using and will start the right dev server and just give you a local development that completely mimics what you can later push to the cloud. So here I'm running in localhost and I immediately have a, a, a website running. And again, this is probably nothing new for, for, for most people watching this talk, but I want us all to remember how different it was from the world of WordPress, or Ruby on Rails, and so on, where setting up a new project always depended on a data layer, on sets of migrations, and where the idea of the backend and the web UI layer were very tightly coupled together, and where things like just instant updates were, were, were rarely as instant, like let's uh, do a little let's do a little update here and get excited about GitCon. Um, we have uh, components here, I can uh, really a, a, a flexible framework that gives us everything that we expect from modern components libraries. Also this idea of, of being able to write Markdown and I think this is another change that's been incredibly influential for the modern web, this idea of structured text files that are very easy to, to work on and share that are git diffable um, and, um, and that are typically defined in Markdown in similar languages. And I think it's easy to miss how much of an influence Git and GitHub and, and the tools around it really had for how much we started leaning on this idea of simple diffable text formats that we can all work on as, as developers and where seeing, seeing the differences are, are really easy. So let's take this new Astro side and let's uh, get it committed. We'll add all my changes and make a little commit message. And then we can push it onto the repository I just created. And again, magic of Git, everything is now synced. We now have a, a whole repository running in GitHub without any provisioning or anything. I know it's something we're just used to, but it really didn't used to be like that. And now I can do something very similar with Netlify and just say Netlify init, let's create and configure a new site. And let me pick the right team. We'll just generate a random name. We'll pick all the defaults here and generate a little tunnel file with settings. And um, here we go. Now I can open my admin UI in Netlify and we'll see that we've created a new deployment 
that uh, ties into our newly created GitHub repository uh, that knows how to do everything I was doing locally in a cloud environment. So again, this is actually very similar to how easy it was to go from just starting a local folder with a Git repository and then instantly having that on GitHub re ready to share with my team or with the whole world uh, if, if I wanted. And in the same way, like we built Netlify on top of those core workflows that GitHub and GitLab and other tools had already started defining. And we just saw how can we extend that all the way to, to being live with something. So in this case, we just put a put on a, a new live uh, application on a on boring Hoover was the title Netlify choose to us today, um, and tied this project entirely to the GitHub workflow. So anything we do in pull requests or branches or anything like that, will start mapping up to what we do here. And obviously. This is just an example of outputting some code from Astro that's uh, HTML, CSS, web primitives that get, get that, that we can publish. Um, but we've also really extended all of these patterns to the server-side code that needs to support our, our UI. So let's try to create a new Netlify function, which is really the idea of a dynamic endpoint in the cloud that we can invoke from um, uh, from the web and talk to from our front end. So I quickly pulled up a new uh, function in TypeScript. We'll see that Netlify has generated a new folder for us and, uh, and, and a little example code. We can start up our Netlify dev server again. And immediately with that available, we can go to our Astro site and we always have this convention where dot netlify slash function slash country will evoke any function based on name. So this here now calls our little server side function that returns hello name. Let's try to do something just a little more interesting here. Um, and uh, we'll add a little GraphQL request library. Oops install a little GraphQL request library here to help us with that. From my function, I'll import a couple of functions from this library, a request function and a GraphQL function. Here we go. Let's define a little GraphQL endpoint. And to get this endpoint, we'll grab it from a little service by Trevor Blades called Countries where we get a little GraphQL API to query for information about countries. And uh, we'll start by figuring out the, the label here by inspecting the headers of the event. Netlify adds a little X country header. We'll fall back to US locally. Uh, and then we'll make a little query. It's a GraphQL query. Um, and let's call it country where the code matches our country code here. And we want the name and the emoji of the country. And let's get a result by awaiting a request to our endpoint from our query. And then we'll simply return this result to the browser and set some headers to say the content type should be application json to be good mime type citizens let's go see here we go we now have an emoji service here let's try to actually do something with that so let's make a country country spot component um, just before we can really render that we should also just make sure to uh, actually tell Astro that we are interested in this kind of render. So we'll go into Astro and, and say, um, hey Astro, how about rendering some swelt when you get to it? And we'll make a little script here in swelt. Um, here we'll say, let's have a fetch country 
country method that's an async call of course that just uses fetch to get a result from our Netlify functions country and then data would be awaiting a little result.json call and then we can return the country and first of all to work its magic we need to say we need it here and then we can say await and then it's a pretty powerful pattern we can just go in here and say loading and then we can go in here and say welcome visitor from Tell what we actually wanted to load. Fetch country and country country name country emoji. Here we go. We now have a whole little swell component around this. It will jump into our astro page and then just just like we can import other astro components, we can also import other Swell components or React components or anything that really has a, a has a render. This is this is one of the things that are really cool with Swell. And then when we want to render this country, we can tell Swell that this we want to do on the client, not at build time. Anything else will happen at build time, but this will happen on the client. And now we can run Netlify Dev. And hopefully we can see this little country personalization passed in action as we go to our website here. Um, what am I missing? Yeah, I have a broken link here in my import. Here we go, all fixed, and now we can welcome all visitors from the United States. It's pretty cool. Let's do a little branch. Again, the git magic of branching, uh, add personalization. I'll just add all the stuff and commit. My team doesn't always like uh, my commit messages. I do and let's push this to our git repo and then let's go here and create a pull request and see what happens personalization here we go create a pull request um, we're starting to do a bunch of work and one of the things we'll immediately see is that Netlify picks this up and starts building the pull request. Again, we've really tried to just tap into the Git-centric workflow and extend anything that happens there. And we'll now see that we are building the, the pull request, we are caching all the initial dependencies, it'll be even faster than the first build and Astro is already pretty fast in, in any case building out the pages, building out the functions, deploying the site, both the new page and the new function. And here we are, we are live. We can now open what we call a deploy preview. And we'll see that this deploy preview, this is really specific to the, to the project we just defined in, in GitHub to the update we made there. And here we are, welcome visitor from the United States. Let me have a little fun and try connecting, for example, from Mexico. Uh, through a VPN. Give me a moment, here we go. Welcome visitor from Mexico. It all worked and it's all flowing in. And again, it's all of these concepts of like, just work locally, just sync with Git. It all comes together, no long lived environment. Everything is, uh, is, is a URL. And at Netlify, we've also really taken that to heart. So. Because this is a deploy preview, I have this little toolbar down here and I can click and I can see all the context from the actual deploy preview. And I can go and write comments back here. Um, and 
those will flow right back to 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 GitHub instantly. I can go in and uh, uh, look at my functions logs from from the country function if I want to debug how it behaves in production. I can see the deploy logs directly here to associate my GitHub build with uh, my Netlify build. Uh, and I could also go in here and say, hey, let me let me make a, a little issue around this. Um, let's uh, take a Chrome window, Astro side here, take a screenshot of it, and um, then maybe make a comment. Um, so under this, say, point to the logo here and my typical CEO comment. Uh, let's open a new issue with that uh, and post it here. And again, this is really again this idea that we can build around the whole workflow that Git has actually already instituted. It's there's no sort of extra step, and everything just works fluently together from local development from local environment and to a collaborative online environment in, in, in GitHub. We see here the GitHub issue has been created. We have a link to it from the pull request to tie everything nicely together. And you can even see that when I took this screenshot, I was using Chrome. You can see the viewport. If you want to debug this, you can directly open it in browser stack. Again, so we use this power of the URL so browser stack can open the exact same URL in the exact same deploy preview with the exact same device, the exact same settings, um, all to tie everything together. And again, all of this is really possible because of how um, we've taken all the learnings from Git and from GitHub and applied them to the web. And if we just jump back to some of my slides here, um, I wanna show one extra thing. Of course, Git itself is really based on this whole idea of of Merkle trees. It's based on this idea that every object is a content addressable object. We take a SHA of the object and we associate the object with that. And uh, and that's what makes all the branching local, uh, all, all the branching magic locally viable and, uh, and uh, fast. And in Netlify, we've also built all of our object storage as one really big uh, Mer Merkle tree. So Essentially, if we go back to, to our pull request here, let's say we go, uh, we open the deploy preview, we merge this in, we confirm the merge, um, and uh, we have the site here, boring Hoover. If I go to my overview, we're now building main here, and tying it in, but every single deploy we've ever made, like if I go in and see the deploy preview. Um, of course, we, we saw the specific deploy preview URL before, but every single deploy also has like a, a unique identifier that will always stick around. So now we published a, a new version of the, of the main site, and of course we can go in and see that that's live, but I can also go in and see the earlier version of the main site, and you'll see this content chat that identifies this specific version It'll always be available and it's always instant. Again, no sort of reloading an old version. And I can go in and say publish deploy and immediately take the immediately do a, a, a rollback from of the of the main side here from the personalized version to the to the earlier version with no interruption. And I can go in and, and I can do exactly the same to roll forward again, just publish the deploy and instantly we're back to the to the new version this is all from this magic of of Merkle, Merkle trees that we really took inspiration from git to implement and i would even argue that these persistent data structures that git popularized also has a great deal of uh, of influence in how we are building web applications today when react came around it brought us this idea of the virtual dome and it brought us this idea of combining state uh, with a function to create a UI and then have that UI be represented 
not as the final mutable DOM that we that that comes with the browsers, but as an intermediary immutable presentation that we could diff and that we could quickly resolve to a set of changes. Later, that idea of of an intermediary layer that combines state um, and and a function to then decide how to update the DOM has been become a part of, of, of any modern JavaScript framework, whether it's well the React or Vue or uh, SolidJS or anything like it. And I think that would probably not have happened either if it wasn't for Git. So I've already talked a long time be, be, of, about all the, all the ways that Git has, has influenced the web. But I want to just go back to this idea that GitHub was sort of inherently decentralized in the way that we could all work locally and instantly and then sync to a central repository. And strangely enough, it was the power of that decentralization that really allowed platforms like GitHub and GitLab and Bitbucket to do so much more for collaborative workflows for developers than any of the earlier source control platforms had, had ever done. They were more seen just like hosting for source control and a way you kept those subversion servers running and updated. But Git never seemed just like source control hosting. It was really around like, how do we collaborate around our source code? How do we build workflows together? And with Netlify, we've tried to apply all of those learnings from the web as you start really shaping up, like clipping off this web UI into its own stateless decoupled layer. We can also in a similar way, build a centralized platform that is not just a hosting place for your websites, but that's really a workflow engine for your whole team to collaborate together faster and build better results for the web in a shorter time. And that's what makes me really excited. And I think as we go deeper into this next generation of, of how we build for, for the web and how the Jamstack evolve, looking into how the patterns and the workflows and the tooling around Git has evolved will give us a lot of clues to what comes next. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. We got a bunch of questions out there on awesome. on the uh, the Discord. Um, thank you so much again for being here. Uh, let's just dive into it because we only have uh, you know, about 15 minutes or so uh, to get through them. So um, I'll just pop them up here on the screen here. Uh, we had Josie in Discord ask, um, what do you see in the future for Git and the web? Do you see any trends changing? Anything new emerging? I know that's a big question, but you're know, <laughs> yes. here to answer, answer the big questions for us. And no, no, we are all done. Nothing new will emerge from now on. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Obviously, that that that, that wouldn't be uh, my thoughts, right? Um, I think when we look at at some of the things I was talking about in the presentation, and some things things I was I was talking through there, like they really came from as we first started adopting Git and then started adopting centralized platforms like GitHub and GitLab Emerge brought alternatives to that and so on. We started uh, getting these concepts like pull requests and like the workflow around pull requests that sort of goes one step further from just the version control of like, how do we control the different versions of, of our source codes and the files? and really goes into like, how do we actually collaborate as developers and how do we build things together, right? And I think that's that's a pattern that has allowed us to sort of take some of those concepts for given and then build on top of them. And it's what I was trying to show with Netlify, right? Like how we've been able to take a primitive like the pull request and build sort of an end-to-end -end flow around it. And we'll see that that idea continue to 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 drive both the web and the and the git platforms forward right like we're seeing github introduce code spaces where you can just hit dot and and now you're editing directly in a space you can commit directly from from the ui there again taking for granted that all this underlying infrastructure of pull requests and commits and workflows around them are in place right you've seen how how netlify how we can integrate into Git, but also um, we can now tie that pull request concept into all the other tooling around the workflow. So yesterday we just launched, for example, our Jira integration that from the same pull request review will allow you to open tickets uh, in 
in Jira and send information there. And we'll make sure that once someone opens that ticket in Jira, we also create a link to that ticket in the pull request. We link back to the pull request for the ticket, tying everything together, right? So there's that whole workflow layer where we'll see both the different tools and platforms and systems around Git evolve to go deeper into like, how can we actually help teams move faster versus just how can we manage versions of code? And you'll see that stretch all the way out to platforms like ours in the realm of like, how can we take all of the gluing and operations and stitchings together uh, away and leave the developers to focus on actually building projects. And in a similar vein, I think we'll see now that all of these conventions are in place and so on, we'll see more of what you call, could call um, self-provisioning runtimes or pure code or infra-free code that's popping up different words for it, um, where you will see also a change from having like one set of like files and rollout procedures and everything for your sort of DevOps infrastructure, maybe with, with a whole DevOps team writing Terraform configs and provisioning all of that. And we'll gradually start seeing some of that just seeping into the general Git workflow around your code. So um, an example for from 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 our end is like how Netlify does form processing, right? Like if you have a form in HTML and you add a little meta tag to it, when you deploy, we'll detect that you need a backend for that form, right? And we'll just like set up it essentially a little database that'll start receiving form submissions. Similar example could be something like Temporal, what they are working on with this idea that um, you can just in code write a whole workflow that might say like when you reach this step, then sleep for a day and then continue here and so on. And behind the scenes, they'll make sure that that get mapped to, to workers and to workflows and to scalable infrastructure that will execute that and, and, and run that. Where before you might have a different team like sort of provisioning clusters for that, that you would talk to and that you would rely on. And I think in general, as, as we progress on the web, we'll see more and more of this end-to-end -end flow where we take the, the Git-centric workflow as, as, as given, as granted, and these like change we build around pull requests and merges is just the way we work. And we'll see a lot of like the underlying sort of um, manual DevOps steps getting inferred more and more just from the code in our repository instead instead of from code living something somewhere else or from configuration files minting somewhere else. Thank you. That was a very big answer to a very big question, but really appreciate the insight there. Um, you brought up Net, uh, Netlify forms there. Uh, yeah. Actually, that's related to a question I actually had. <laughs> uh, uh, it, Netlify is pretty amazing. I um, was always blown away. Like as soon as I saw the split branching uh, for AB deployments, it, it just blew my mind. I um, was hoping you could give us a little bit of a peek into uh, what what mind blowing advancements Netlify is going to come out with <laughs> next, or, or, or around you know Git management and, and branch management. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it was was what I showed the early stages on with with what we call collaborative deploy previews, right? Like, I think this this is this is still a new area for us, and there's a lot of work to do there. But it, but I'm extremely excited about like all the potential there, where we're really turning. Like early on, we were sort of pioneers in 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 bringing the concept of deploy previews to the market and saying like every time you have a pull request we will give you a URL where you can view that pull request, right? And it sort of turned every single pull request into a, a staging environment, essentially, right? Um, but for a long time, the only thing we did with that was just give you the URL, right? And, and, and you can share it, right? And now with collaborative deploy previews, we've started sort of to build the, the UI for that workflow on top of every pull request, right? And and that's going to be really powerful because it turns like again, it it turns the actual like visible URL you can share into something that can be aware of what pull pull request this is part of and what's going on there. 
and there's a lot of things like that we're starting to 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 see there obviously i i just mentioned things like our jira integration right where we can start tying together these different projects there's also things like how you can open up that pull request and go see your actual function logs as they as they run and as you debug right there's things like our browser stack integration where you can just uh, click like submit a, a, a bug report from the pull request and we'll capture all the, the, the browser information and we'll let the developer on the other end just click a link and open up the same URL uh, in the same OS, the same browser, the same resolution and browser stack. And you can imagine how we can build layers and layers of tooling on top of that, right? Um, imagine cap being able to capture more uh, detailed debug information from a whole session on that pull request and send it back to the developer Imagine tools uh, like uh, stack blitz being open to being able to open the same environment running in 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 their browser based containers with um, with with your site generator running uh, in the browser and you can edit directly and we can send those edit directly back to the pull request right that that whole area is uh, is is really powerful and then there's of course other parts of our platform like we're currently running a private beta have what we call edge handlers that are a bit similar to 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 netlify functions but where netlify functions are more used to write your api endpoints and things like that edge handlers runs directly at the um, at the request response level of of the each cdn edge node and you can use them to completely programmatically take control of our edge uh, rewrite engine you can use them to do transforms at the edge, do personalization and so on, right? And so far, when, when you've relied on, on different edge runtimes to do that, you've had like you've had again like a completely different rollout and uh, deployment flow for those than for your actual web property that depends on them, right? So this is another area where having those edge handlers just be part of your Git repository having being able to just open a pull request with a new set of edge logic and getting a URL where you can see exactly how that will behave if you take it live. That's just another way of like how tying into this Git centric process enhances pretty much every every piece of the piece of the workflow. And then I'm also excited about like uh, sort of emerging technologies like what planet scale is doing for branching at the data level. Um, which is obviously going to be like we're going to have to see more tools starting to build conventions around that. But as as that happens, I think this concept of a deploy preview with with a um, stateless web UI that has its own URL will get even more powerful because now we can say this this deploy preview, if you're working on an application, might talk to a branch of your production database and you can safely test, you can safely do things, it won't mess with production data, but at the same time, it's already sort of like uh, the the real thing out of out of the box. So that's another area I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about. That's awesome. Thank you very much for, for sharing that with us. Uh, I know I'm not the only person out there as excited. You can see in the Discord stream, um, many people are seeing a lot of really Really awesome things. Moving on, so we have about five minutes left for Q and A. Uh, this is kind of a very specific question, but Nexus out there uh, ask us or this: uh, My former employee has a patent on blockchain technology for storage of things like event logging, user profiles, etc. Um, how would something like Git slash Netlify be used in situations where history matters more in places like DB? Yeah, Git is kind of like the original blockchain. You know, like uh, um, it's it's kind of how 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 it works, just uh, without uh, burning as much carbon for every transaction. <laughs> um, but uh, honestly, that that that's something a lot of people have have been working on. Uh, we we have an open source project that's mainly community based today, but uh, that's called Netlify CMS. Um, that uh, allows you to add uh, content editing for anything that's like Markdown or, or JSON or anything based where the content editing works directly on top of your Git repository and works through, through GitHub and so on, right? And of course, one of the advantages of that is exactly this, that it, it might be less flexible than a general purpose database in search 
in terms of searching, querying, anything, right? But it suddenly gives you that full history and the pull request process. Um, for example, at Netlify, we use it from for, for our internal uh, company handbook, right? Where where it's an important part for everybody that you can go in and see, hey, we are updating a, a policy for how we do project management or something. How was it before? What is it now? Which would typically be harder to sort of keep keep on top of and and have a discussion around in in a typical CMS, but that works really well with this like history preserving um, Git process uh, and uh, um, the founder of of um, um, what are they called? Uh, now I'm blanking on the Jenkins based Git Git uh, Jake, originally Jekyll based uh, Git CMS just posted a great blog post on our end on the future of, of Git-based CMA content management. Um, it's an area that, that's, that's still pretty green, that's, that started back in the day with, with, uh, with pros, and then, yeah, uh, Cloud Cannon is, uh, uh, is, the, is the tool. Um, started with pros, Cloud Cannon, Netlify CMS, Forestry has all been doing things there, right? It's still, I still feel that it's an area that hasn't sort of been fully developed a fully exploited to what it could be. But I think it's a pretty exciting um, field exactly because you get all of these kind of blockchain like characteristics for your content that you can suddenly see every change that every ha ever happened. You can go back and run, get blame on 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 any any change and see who actually updated that or wrote that. Um, and getting all of that tooling out of the box is, is, is pretty amazing. And then you can start also getting all the tooling around deploy previews and collaborative deploy previews and, and all of these things that, that we are all building on top of the underlying sort of Git concepts. Thank you very much. Uh, it is very exciting time for, I, I've never heard anyone quite phrase like that. Git is the you know original blockchain, <laughs> uh, but I very much agree. That's uh, as somebody who's written a lot of content in Markdown and all sorts of uh, Yugo, Jekyll, Next.js, whatnot. Um, it's kind of amazing to go back and see your own notes and thoughts. And we have actually have a talk about uh, writing a book in Git tomorrow from Jesse Shakarian. Um, so tune back in for that, folks, if you're interested in that. Uh, so in the, the last couple minutes here, um, uh, we have a, a really short question that I think is just uh, uh, right to ask. And then if we have uh, time for that, oh, after that, one more. So um, Kevin asked, do you know what happened to Perforce? Is it still around? Is it just... Wouldn't know if that'd be an expert uh, subject you'd know about, but just thought we'd ask. <laughs> <laughs> no expert, but but uh, Perforce solved sort of a very different need than Git, um, where Git is is excellent around all this text based content, and I think it has driven a lot of uh, even like uh, in in inventions in the space of text based content, right? Like I think Markdown wouldn't be as popular if it wasn't for Git and so on, right? And 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 it's fantastic tooling as long as you're dealing with mostly structured text of some form. But once you're dealing with with really big uh, assets like video files or PSD files or anything like that, Git is not like was not built for that originally, and 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 the underlying Merkle tree model is not great for that kind of content. So Perforce from the beginning was really built for like, how do you do version control when you're working on uh, video games and you have like massive directories of art produced by by uh, artists and so on, right? And uh, I think it still plays a, an, an important role in, in, in that space, but it's a very different use case. Awesome. Uh, and then just last party chat, you realize we only have about 30 seconds for an answer here. Um, oop, let me click, hit the right button here. Um, is, is Git too magical? Is it, is it too, uh, is it too much? I don't think so. I mean, I, I think it, the, one of the beautiful things of Git is that you can just sort of type ls.git and start looking at the underlying blobs and uh, references and so on. Um, Underneath it all, Git is in, in some ways just a, a simple set of tools for, for, for working on top of this Merkle tree construction. And, and um, it's actually, I mean, it takes a little, but it's not that hard to just dig in and learn like what, what's Git actually doing beneath it all. And then of course we've built all of these 
magical, like a lot of us have been working on tooling on top of Git that makes it feel more intuitive and more magical and so on. Um, but once you get the fundamentals, I think one of the beauties of Git is that 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 below it all, it's act, it's it's actually fairly simple in a way. I agree with you 100%. Once you wrap your mind around it, once you accept everything's local, everything, it starts <laughs> falling into place after that and uh, makes a pretty good worldview.